Uh, good evening to everyone. I'm Beth Ann Brooks, a co-chair along with Dr. John Comer for oh. the series on pandemics, old and new. Uh, welcome to our final presentation in the 2021 Winter Lecture Series, sponsored by the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, Humanities Nebraska, and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. A special thank you to Kelly Ross and Bob Fusion for their technical expertise in navigating our Zoom platform, and also to Winter Lecture Series committee members, Dr. Sherrod Seth and Dick Deanspear for their administrative assistance. Now, I am pleased to introduce Sharon Ray Stuhlman, MD, who is a pediatric hospital medicine physician at Children's Hospital and Medical Center in Omaha. Dr. Stuhlman received her Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University and then studied at Southern Illinois University before attending the University of Nebraska College of Medicine on a four-year academic scholarship. During medical school, Dr. Stuhlman was a founding member of the Sharing Medical Student Clinic for the Under Uninsured and Student Chapter President of the American Medical Women's Association. Dr. Stuhlman interned in surgery at UNMC after which she completed a residency in pediatrics at the Creighton, Nebraska Joint Pediatric Residency Program. She progressed through the academic ranks at UNMC and was promoted to Associate Professor of General Pediatrics in 2012. Initially, her academic assignment was as the Director of Undergraduate Medical Education in Pediatrics. The recipient of several teaching awards, Dr. Stuhlman has the distinction of being only one of two pediatric residents ever honored with the Resident of the Year Award from UNMC. She was elected um, to membership in Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society and is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. At Children's Hospital, Dr. Stuhlman serves on no less than 13 committees in addition to providing pediatric hospitalist services. Dr. Stuhlman frequently provides professional presentations uh, in the Omaha area, to regional audiences, and at national educational conferences. Her publications have focused on pediatric education, and she currently is a faculty coordinator for a synthesis block in the UNMC resident program. Dr. Stuhlman has served medical missions in Zaire and Jamaica, and since 2013, she has been the camp physician at Camp Super Kids, hosted by the American Lung Association me and welcoming Dr. Sharon Stolman and enjoying her presentation, Sorting Through Racial Disparities in COVID-19. We will be muting the audience during the lecture and encourage everyone to post questions through the Zoom chat function. Take it away, Dr. Stolman. Thank you. Bethann, I'd like you to give all of my introductions. Um, I, uh, I feel like that sounds really like it was a very thoughtful plan and progression through my life. Um, and um, uh, while I'm very happy with where I've landed, um, it maybe hasn't always been um, as um, it was sometimes by um, grace and luck that I have ended up where I am. So um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and I will try to keep up with the chat. Um, but I am okay if people want to unmute and interrupt me um, as we go through. And I'm going to start sharing my slides. Um, so... Stolman, I think that Kelly um, may be muting everyone and she will oh, okay. in reading the, the chat questions. And then if we continue to have time, people can ask questions in person. Will that work? Yes. Okay, wait a minute, Kelly. I don't know if I'm sharing my screen. Hold on. I'm I going don't to... see it yet. Okay, hold on. I'm going to share screen. And then start from the beginning. Why am I not seeing, hold on. There we go. Okay, now are we seeing it? Yes, it looks wonderful. And just okay. ignore the, the, the chat. I'll take care of the chat for okay. you. So. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I, uh, um, so, COVID-19, uh, when I think back to a year ago, um, or even a little bit earlier, um, it's very 
very vivid how we stumbled through the beginning months of um, learning about the virus, learning about um, its um, mortality. Um, and I think back to this first and second week in March and what we were sort of doing. And um, it's hard to uh, believe it's been a year. Um, and in that year, so much has happened both um, within the healthcare crisis, um, but within our uh, political community um, and uh, our city community. And so um, this hour will go very quickly in my mind. Um, so uh, because I'm an educator, I usually write as, um, objectives. That's uh, sort of how my brain thinks and hopes to organize myself. But I hope that um, in this 45 minutes, we'll explore the historical origins of the healthcare disparities um, in the US and specifically in Omaha, um, because that's where we are. And uh, to review some of the current racial and ethnic disparities um, about the COVID-19 health crisis. And then to look at some of the social determinants of health impacting our risk and maybe some next steps that we can take. Um, so, uh, I find it so amazing that so much of what was said in 1963 and 64 is still so very relevant to our lives today um, in 2021. Of all the inequities that exist, the injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and the most inhumane. Um, and from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and I would agree, I, I, I always am, um, a little confused at how we um, argue about whether healthcare is a human right, um, uh, but here we are. So a lot of talk has been um, said about how the healthcare system is broken, um, and I would disagree. The healthcare system is not broken. Modern medicine was not created to give equal access to all. It was not created to serve all. Um, it was created to serve a specific demographic of whites, um, and almost more specifically of whites that could pay um, and had social access. So the system is working as it's designed. The, the challenge for us is how do we reset or redesign or um, change the foundational things of modern healthcare. Um, so uh, when we look uh, at healthcare in Omaha, uh, prior to the civil rights, one of the things I found fascinating um, in my most recent, I love how this is sponsored by lifelong learning, but in some of my most recent readings is I don't remember learning about healthcare prior to um, the Civil Rights Act um, or where, and trying to imagine where did people of color access healthcare before civil rights? Um, and maybe that's a privilege of being young and um, being born into a time when um, there was relatively um, on the surface uh, uh, equal access to all, um, but it wasn't really covered in my medical education um, where a black person would go for an emergency. Um, and so I, I thought this was an interesting quote. Dr. Gooden was one of the um, a few prominent black physicians who practiced in Omaha, Nebraska around the 1920s. Um, and he speaks about how hard it was to get um, blacks uh, healthcare um, at that time. Um, so the other thing that I've found um, important lately is I'm not very active on social media platforms, um, but when I'm looking at them, I find that there's a lot of discrepancy in terms. Um, and uh, again, I think it's important to start foundationally with what are um, the terms. There's been a lot of discussion about racism and reverse racism and privilege and prejudice. And so um, I just want to go back and say, well, what is racism? And it's this idea that there are specific traits about one race that would make it superior um, and another race or other races inferior. Um, and then with that belief, it is building a system um, that uh, dispenses uh, pr privileges, access um, uh, to that superior race. So it's not just that you're prejudiced against a race, but it is um, social, economic, and political power being dispensed based on that belief of superiority. So in that sense, um, Reverse racism would imply that there was some political or power um, being um, uh, 
directed against whites. So it's more that there's just a, lot, a rise in prejudice against whites. Um, and so then the other term that comes up in the question of, is there such a thing as systemic racism or is there still an impact of systemic racism? So, you know, if we've worked really hard to have um, actions like the Civil Rights Act of 1965 or um, to be more, uh, um, equal access, are we still living with the impact of systemic racism? And I would say that the, the reality is that we, it's, it's relevant even in this idea of the Dr. Seuss controversy, um, that Dr. Seuss still has a legacy um, and his legacy is still relevant. However, he was the product of his environment, which is that he learned that there was a superior race that was implicit in all of his education. Um, and I don't know that there was malice, um, but the books show uh, derogatory images and whether we should continue to share those derogatory images is sort of the question. And not so much that Dr. Seuss had some malice in his heart, but was he a product of his time? Um, and um, should those be continued to be considered uh, acceptable books for children to see that may give the wrong idea of Chinese, Blacks, Latinos. Um, so there is some normative um, information that's out there. Um, one of the things that was really hard, um, and I didn't really think about it till I'm showing my young son Disney movies that I grew up, grew up watching and realizing the imagery of the Black crows in Dumbo or the Native Americans in Peter Pan and how subtle that is to give us this, to inform us on how we're to believe or to see people of color or indigenous people. Um, so when we look back to healthcare after um, slavery was uh, over and I start with all this foundational stuff, probably this is my Georgetown background, um, but I look at how does, how does policy, politics, all of this sort of all come together. Um, so when slavery is over, it is not as though we automatically said, we're all gonna live together in this beautiful, happy, ha um, uh, unified place. Um, then we have the Jim Crow era. And um, for much of my life, I grew up in Nebraska and I'm Nebraska nice. We whisper the word cancer. Um, we don't really wanna talk about race. We don't, um, yeah, uh, it's it's not it's sort of it's sort of taboo. It would be distasteful. And so while I knew the terms Jim Crow, I don't know that I really understood the what that really meant. So these were both formal like laws. This room is for you. We don't serve Hispanics and informal practices that kept the races separate. And those were up, upheld from the by the Supreme Court. And I remember hearing about the court case Plessy versus Ferguson that went through the Supreme Court, but not really understanding the impact of what that meant. And what that meant was that separate and what was thought to be equal is legal and okay. So that there was separate housing, separate schools, separate transportation, separate restrooms, and therefore separate healthcare. But what we know is that separate was not equal and that the healthcare access for whites was very different than it was for blacks or Hispanics or um, Asians. Um, and so we created real barriers to access. So we have historical real barriers to access to care um, that are still, not that far away from 2021, where we have limited hospitals and designated housing areas for communities of color and limited access to white, house, white hospitals prior to um, civil rights. So this is something um, that um, in the last two years, I have really come to learn more about and was not part of my education as an Omaha um, and impacted me when my husband and I went to buy a house. Um, indirectly. Um, but this is a historical map that would have been given out to someone new moving to Omaha um, that would show where you should buy a house if you are a person, a white person. Um, and so I'm going to go to another slide, but if you look at this area right here, it's very geographic, this D. This is the red lined area that was designated as acceptable area for Blacks. That's not the term they used to rent or, um, or to buy houses. Um, and then um, the um, other areas. And so this we'll see, this is, this was very specifically done by our civic leaders in Omaha in the Jim Crow era, um, that this is the clear boundaries that blacks were allowed to um, buy or own houses, Cumming Street being as far south as possible. So my husband and I went to buy a house after my finished med school. 
um, from UNMC and my husband moved here from um, Westchester, Scarsdale, New York, um, in Dundee. And Dundee would have had covenants through the early 1920s, um, like many of the Western communities. And those covenants would have limited your ability to sell your property or rent your property to a person of color. So over the phone, because I have what people would consider um, an educated sounding voice, we were pre-approved for a loan from a bank. Um, uh, my husband was working for Ameritrade. I'm going to work at UNMC. Um, we give the $1,000 earnest payment, and then we go in to do some of the loan documents. And um, a person in her 60s, a white woman, was like, I don't know if this is the house for you. I think you should look a little bit. And she pointed to Country Club and over here um, um, and um, declined to give us our loan. And we had already put an earnest payment down. So we had to find a different lender. Um, and so indirectly, I was very unaware that this was a, a significant thing. Our realtor asked us if we wanted to pursue it under fair um, lending practices. We just wanted to buy our house and we didn't want to make a fuss. Um, and we found another lender and just moved on. Um, but um, looking at how this impacts people still today. I'm astounded when I look at this business card and that this would be an acceptable advertisement um, for um, a realtor to have as to um, make Florence a community look great, um, that you would put on the front of your business card this, or that um, there would be things in place to avoid the N invasion. Um, so these are real practices, um, you know, not quite a hundred years ago that were that were impacting Omaha's community. And so this is a a, a data a dot plot of uh, Omaha's racial um, slash ethnic um, um, population in 2015. So uh, white is blue, green is black, orange is Hispanic. And um, this is the North Freeway slash Highway 75, and this would be Dodge Street here. So you can look that redlining has a significant impact on where people still live in 2015. Um, uh, and then I like to think, and someday I'll get really good, or maybe I'll befriend Kelly, um, and I'd love to plot hospitals on this. Um, and to look at where the hospitals are, because in my youth, there would have been a hospital here, Creighton, which is sort of closed, and there's a hospital here. But now if we look, the hospitals are all coming out here. Um, and um, in response to um, uh, private payer insurance um, distribution. So this is the impact of uh, segregated housing, that you look at where the lead smelters were, um, where our super fund has to work um, with regard to um, the North Omaha community, and then where the hospitals move out of, the Lutheran Hospital um, that has closed down and moved out, um, Creighton that has closed down and become just a, a clinic. And you look and you see the medical desert, um, and then, um, one of the things that one of my son's um, school classmates did was a project that calculated the general generational wealth that would be lost based on property values um, uh, in um, the redlined area versus property values in a west side area. Um, so there's a huge impact. Um, and so again, I'll go back to where did people of color go before they were sick? Um, before 1965 if they were sick. So their access to emergency care was very limited and they went to charity hospitals. So very dependent upon people of faith to have uh, a generous heart. Um, and so the Salvation Army, Methodist Health Systems, Mercy Health Systems. Um, and I, um, in learning my own background, my mother um, had come back from a mission trip um, for two years in the Caribbean and was uh, pregnant and unwed. Um, and in 1972, that was still quite uh, controversial. And so I was born at this hospital, Booth Hospital, which is still on UNMC's campus um, for unwed mothers. Um, and it's where medical students practice their craft. So the access was still that you had access, but um, you were getting medical students and not uh, attending level um, care. So then there's so we had real barriers created and then we have emotional barriers that were created in the in the racism of the care that you're given. Um, and one of the topics that um, 
within the Black community is very often spoke of, but maybe not spoken of outside of, is the Tuskegee experiment and what that really was. So that was an intentional experiment. It was a research study that was set up to see the natural progression of syphilis. So 400 Black men were not infected with syphilis by the government. They had syphilis. We knew that syphilis was um, a terrible disease that caused degenerative conditions and death. And yet we deliberately left them untreated and had and followed their natural history um, uh, without telling them that this was going to kill them. Um, and many of their children um, and their relatives are still alive. So whether these men are, um, can, uh, are, can still speak their truth, the reality is that um, their truth still permeates our lack of trust with the healthcare community. Um, and so this is a real barrier to um, having a trusting relationship with research. So when we're talking about the COVID-19 vaccine um, and initially in the summer wanting to get it to the black communities, the initial response within the black communities is once again, you're using us as test subjects. You're trying to see um, if it's safe and you'll give it to us first. And then if it's not safe uh, or if it is safe, then we'll give it to whites. Um, so there is a significant um, need to re-engage and re-establish trust with, this, with ex exquisite transparency um, in the Black community. And then I, this is a tragic story um, that played out last fall. There was an Indiana uh, physician, woman physician, Dr. Susan Moore, who contracted COVID-19 in November. She went into her local hospital um, and um, was treated or made to feel that she was exaggerating her symptoms um, and that um, they were hesitant to give her narcotics. They said that she videotaped them um, and she was treated uh, terribly um, and was discharged home in spite of being quite dyspneic and sick and having underlying health conditions. She was, um, unresponsive and re, uh, was taken emergently to another hospital within 12 hours of her discharge um, uh, and was treated with great compassion, she says, at that second hospital. However, she died as a complication of COVID. Um, and this is, um, she put it up on Facebook. Again, I'm not on Facebook, but if you want to watch her video, Dr. Moore's video, is it's, it's pretty hard to watch in the sense that she believes that her care was specifically, and not because was different because of the color of her skin. And the hard part for me as an educated woman is I would like to tell my children that if you follow the rules, if you follow the laws, if you get an education um, and uh, you'll be okay. And that isn't always the case. And that's, that is what is privilege, is that the privilege is for your hard work to mean something. The privilege is for your education um, or your um, effort to mean something. And for Dr. Moore, um, she, uh, uh, it couldn't protect her. Um, and, um, and, that, uh, and if she has a hard time advocating for herself as a physician, uh, and a very highly educated person, how does the average person interact with the healthcare community and advocate for themselves? So this is um, just some um, hard data because I'm a scientist. So this is, do you, do you have a personal doctor? So most of the follow-up from the ER will say, call your PCP if you get worse. Call your doctor if you have questions. That's what the CDC will say. But when we look, um, white, and this is for Nebraska, 78% um, of whites say yes, they have a personal physician. 63% of blacks say yes and Native American or indigenous people, and only 60% of Asians and um, the Hispanics, very low, 44%. Uh, so um, just even the simple question of, do you have a doctor? Um, I would hope that most, if I ask most people in the audience, they would say, yeah, I have a doctor. I have a doctor. I know who I'd call if I have questions. Um, that's sort of a scary thing to think about. We're going into a pandemic and you don't know who to call to get accurate information. Um, the next question is, do you have health care coverage? So um, this is, you know, expensive. Uh, so 90% of whites will say, yes, I have health care. I have health care coverage. A good percentage of blacks say, yeah, I have health care coverage, more than the majority, and Native Americans. Um, Hispanics, half, half 
have health care coverage. That's terrifying to enter into a pandemic without health care coverage. Do you go to the hospital if you don't have insurance? How long do you wait till it's too late? What do you do? Can you, you don't have a PCP. So um, before Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, there was our President Lyndon B. Johnson after the death of uh, uh, President Kennedy and the war on poverty. And the Civil Rights Act paved the way for universal health care and opened the idea of Medicare for the elderly and Medicaid for the poor, um, which is our first sort of uh, steps towards equity and equal access um, in the 60s. We are still working and walking that journey, um, but here, here's where we begin. Um, I remember talking about Brown versus the Board of Education, and we've seen the images of Ruby Bridges. And this most recent year, we've seen the shadow of Ruby and Kamala Harris as our um, vice president. Um, uh, but the impact of Brown versus education was on more than education. It states that public facilities cannot be segregated, which then can be broadly applied to hospitals. So then we can have access to hospitals for emergency care um, and increased access um, for other um, uh, hospitalizations. But poor access leads to poor outcomes. We've known that and that makes sense and it's logical lack of insurance. Um, inability to communicate with your provider. I um, have so much empathy and think, how would I if, I, if I was traveling abroad and my child or my husband was sick, how overwhelming would that be? Um, and then, um, you know, they give me some paperwork to go home and read if I have more questions, but I don't always know if our patients are even literate in the language that we give them the paperwork in. Um, and then how do I get accurate information? So um, I've been reading quite a bit that this WhatsApp, which is on Facebook, has been where a, a large majority of Mexicans are getting their information about COVID and the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and so, um, you know, how do we spread truths about that, about what, what is a good way to keep yourself safe and healthy during a pandemic? So if we look at Nebraska, um, uh, we, we're we not one of the most diverse states, but we know that. 86% um, um, consider themselves white, 4% consider themselves black, 11% consider themselves Latino. And I think this is a good slide to remind us that Latino is an ethnicity. So you can be ethnically Irish and racially black the same way that you can be ethnically Latino and racially black. And so there's some overlap if you think that doesn't add up to 100. 2% um, think, uh, see themselves as Asian and 1% as indigenous. This is as of 2019's uh, census data. So this is the most current um, uh, data of our cumulative mortality in COVID-19. So as of March, 2020, if we look at um, the mortality rate per race. Indigenous people um, have the highest mortality rate um, in the U.S. with Blacks and Pacific Islanders next, uh, Whites and Latino, and then Asian at the, um, uh, at the end. It's still a very deadly disease, but this is a significant uh, uh, delta between the um, races. Um, so this sort of is uh, for me an easier, I think pictures are great, but I look at it. So the death rate for blacks is 108 per 100,000 versus indigenous 90. Um, um, this is has died, um, Pacific Islanders, whites. So if we add all of this up, indigenous black and Latinos are over two times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white Americans, even adjusted for their age. So it is more deadly in our, in our communities of color. And the question becomes, why is this? Um, I don't know how many of you in the beginning of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, I looked at this Johns Hopkins dashboard three, six, 12 times a day. I almost needed it to stop. It was so compulsive because these little dots like that movie Contagion just kept spreading and spreading. But this is the current dashboard. So, um, you know, the U.S. does have a significant burden of this um, of this pandemic. Um, and um, our our modern healthcare system has not um, 
done as well as we would have hoped we could have done. Um, and many of much of that um, has to do with our independent uh, lifestyle. So COVID-19 is really facing forcing us to confront the systemic racism that built our US healthcare system. Um, it's exposing the impact of poverty and racism on our health. And it's asking us, are you willing to step up and make some changes in these communities? So when we look at how did we get here, we look at what we would call the social determinants of health. So your housing, your family income, your childhood experiences, your education, social support, access to healthcare. These are the, the, the basket that makes up how you are, how healthy you are. Um, the other question that I um, that I hear or um, that I read about is, um, is are, do we believe some of these racial myths of biology? Is there something weaker about um, uh, Black genetics? Is there something in Latino genetics that makes them more susceptible to COVID-19? And the answer is the virus is not racist. The virus is um, deficient. Um, but there, there's not a biological marker that explains this. Um, is this because they, people of color don't follow rules or they can't, they don't listen? Um, are we going to blame the victims? Because that's something we're, we're pretty good as a U.S. society is we'll blame the victims for, um, for their uh, bad outcome. But when we look at the social determinants of health, people in these communities live in high density housing. So they aren't able to isolate. So I remember watching Chris Cuomo on CNN isolate himself from his wife, where he lived in the basement and she lived upstairs. Um, and there were the, the two of them and their children versus two families sharing an apartment or one family sharing an apartment. Um, so in high level house and high levels of poverty, this, this isolation is very difficult. Then we think about, well, what did we do um, uh, when we, reacted to this. We ordered on Amazon with our credit card for it to be delivered. We avoided shopping in stores. We had pickup. And so um, if you use ADT or SNAP, can you order online? Um, or do you have to shop in stores? If you have four children um, and your husband works, um, where do you take the children or do you take them shopping with you? Um, then the other question is, can you work from home? So you look at the percentage of um, uh, essential workers. Um, and, you know, we have the benefit of working from home. Um, educational status gives you the benefit of working from home. So fewer people of color can work from home. Um, I would love um, a data plot on um, where the grocery stores are in Omaha. Um, I have foster children and um, in early on in um, taking them home, I discovered that there are not what I would consider the regular grocery stores um, in their neighborhoods, there are convenience stores. And those convenience stores sell packaged foods um, and uh, it's very hard to find fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and um, I live in Dundee, so not even very far west. And we have a variety, we have a Baker's and a High Bee and a um, Fairway. Um, but when you go out west, there's all kinds of exciting different stores. Um, uh, and so when we look at your acts, natural grocers and, um, and different access, so um, different access to healthy food. So when people say, well, why do they have diabetes? My son for his sociology had to do a project and was given the amount of money that each SNAP person is given for a, a three meals um, and had to go to the store and buy three meals for under $5 uh, because that is what's uh, for one person. Um, and it's easier to buy. And so he bought ramen noodles, super high in sodium and um, processed food. Um, he bought um, those mandarin orange fruit cups because they had to have something from each food group. Um, and then he's allergic to beans. So he bought eggs, um, but he couldn't buy very many eggs. I think he bought six. Um, so uh, it's fascinating to look at how that contributes to chronic health problems like diabetes and hypertension when you look at the type of foods they eat. Um, and then um, uh, chronic stress um, and, uh, uh, and that impact on uh, hypertension and chronic conditions. So um, the other question to ask is if you needed to go to the doctor, so now you think you have COVID, um, but would you go because you're not sure if you could pay for it? 
So when you look at the percentage of people, again, Hispanics, um, Native Americans and Blacks, a higher percentage would say they wouldn't go because they're not sure they could pay. So this summer, um, amongst all the other things going on, Douglas County declared racism was a public health crisis. And so this is just a slide from Channel 6 News that says the Douglas County Health Department has declared that racism is a public health crisis based on more than 100 studies that link racism to worse outcomes. And they have a 15 point action plan, which I think is wonderful that we're going to say it out loud. It exists. Racism exists. And we um, uh, the segregation that has existed in Omaha has exacerbated our health care disparities and that we have to do something about that because the life expectancies are different, the infant mortality is different, uh, chronic diseases are different, and we need to do something about it. When you just look at poverty status in Nebraska as a whole, it's about 13%. Um, Non-Hispanic whites is about 10%, so lower than the average, and uh, African Americans or Black communities is uh, 33%. Um, so that there's huge room for improvement here. Um, in improving um, disparity. I've talked super fast. I feel like I'm just on, like I need to slow down. Um, but then before, I wanna always say more than just talking, more than just complaining, what do we need to do at, um, to make this difference? So how do we respond? And looking at it at the individual level, at the community level, or at this institution level. So at the individual level, I have to examine my own actions. Um, I. I don't get a pass as a woman of color, as a black woman to say, I've never had racist thoughts. I've never done racist thing or I've never been judgmental or uh, condemned people for their um, inaction, not understanding their situation. And so I think we have to really examine how are we um, judging people? How are we helping people? How are we engaging um, with others? And is it in a caring and compassionate way um, and on each interaction. At the community level, um, how do we change that segregation that exists? So how do we engage with people outside of our own community? How do we reintegrate um, each other? Um, and at the institution level, so I, I say that when I sit in on meetings and planning meetings, and I, I have to ask the difficult question when we're looking at clinic expansion, why did we pick 180th? Um, instead of 60th and Ames. Um, are we looking at where the population density is or where the payer mix is? So I think, you know, where, where you're, if you're at the table um, for discussions of planning, are we asking those difficult questions? Is this, will this improve our, the health of our community or will this improve the health of our budget? And those are hard questions to ask. Oh, I went backwards, sorry. Um, so, I, I think the other really discrete things is looking at how do we increase healthcare professionals in low income areas? Um, how do we increase access to care in st specifically struggling communities and in our indigenous communities? Um, how do we change that poverty level? So we have to invest in education. We have to invest in businesses and those communities um, because as we saw in the social determinants of health, we need those communities to be, uh, those childhood experiences to be great, the education to be great um, and to change those communities um, and their uh, chronic stress. Um, we need to continue to be active and not passive in, in integrating for diverse and inclusive and equitable practices everywhere. Um, education reform, criminal justice reform. I didn't put in, um, there's a ton of um, very interesting historical information on um, Omaha's school system, which I am a product of and am very proud of the great education I got from Omaha Public Schools and was unaware of the, um, segregated um, and racist um, structure that has built um, the Omaha Public Schools and what do we do to make a change moving forward um, because we are at um, sort of Brown versus the Board of Education levels of um, uh, segregation again in 2021. Um, and then um, what we found with um, remote learning and Zoom platforms is that um, 
uh, the internet access in these low com in low income communities is terrible. Um, I loved seeing the resourcefulness of different communities in other states where Kentucky put um, an internet box in a school bus and parked the bus places so that um, people could come. So I think we can be, we're very creative um, Americans and we can, we can think ways around this and we can do things to, to really improve access to all. Um, and so this is just, we looked at the disparities. We said there's tons of poverty. We have real barriers to access care and we have emotional barriers. We have a lot of comorbidities in the community based on um, social determinants of health. Um, there's still that, like Dr. Moore, discrimination, um, unemployment. This biological mechanisms always come up um, but has yet to really play out. I remember learning in medical school that blacks had thicker skin and I didn't really stop to ask myself, is that true? And then when you look at the actual pieces of the dermis, it isn't. The dermis is the dermis and it has the same layers. So I, I'm skeptical on the biological mechanisms on whether the virus really has a propensity towards brown and black um, uh, people. Um, and then um, are there some cultural um, uh, issues that are still uh, impacting our ability um, to get to care? And so we just got to get in there and improve access. Um, we've got to protect our essential workers. Um, uh, and there's so much else, but that, that's where I think that we really, we need vaccines for those essential workers. There was just something in, I think it was the New York Times this morning that, um, Rite Aid in Philadelphia, 97%, um, I want to say, of the vaccines were given out to whites in the last week. Um, so when we look at vaccine distribution, some of it will be because Blacks are really still have a lot of vaccine hesitancy, but the other is just that um, that educational um, social class privilege of who's going to get the shot. It's who's out there advocating for themselves to get the shot. Okay, so I've talked really quickly. I don't even know what time it is. Oh, I'm pretty good, 7.45. I did a pretty good job. So we'll open it up for questions. All right, so uh, if you would like, you can stop sharing your screen. Okay. And then, okay. so, you know, you did mention that through your education and experience, you have developed a skepticism of the supposed biological mechanisms that affect COVID-19 health disparities. So there are two questions that um, are in that category. So the okay. first question from Doug and Lois, has any differences in natural immunity among the races been identified? No, so, um, you know, humoral and T-cell immunity has not been found to be different uh, between blacks, whites, Asians, um, there are people with lower immunity um, based on their chronic illness or chronic medications, um, but the immune system firing has not been found to be different. Um, uh, so um, that has not explained the, the mortality difference, no. Thank you. And then the next question, what is hypothesized as to why Asians tend to have a lower COVID rate? Yeah, I, um, I will just claim that I'm not going to speculate on things I don't know and say I don't know um, um, why Asians, um, we have a very low Asian population in Nebraska, so I think we'd have to look at some of the other states with uh, maybe in the western um, uh, part of the country and see. Um, uh, I, if I were just to speculate, like just to speculate, I would say it would be ability to isolate, ability to work from home. Um, uh, access to quality health care um, and um, uh, understanding of the disease. Yeah, thank you. David asks, are there cultural barriers to acceptance of COVID vaccinations? And if so, how can this be overcome? I know. So um, I think when I talk to many of my um, Black physician friends, that's Dr. Snyder. I have a friend. I told you I was at my office, you never know what's going to happen here. Um, so this has been a huge challenge. Um, and as even in the summer, as they were starting to talk about the vaccine, um, there's just so much um, 
fear from uh, within um, uh, Black communities about the safety of something new um, and the ability to trust your doctor when they say it's it's going to be okay. And now we also then have Facebook and all this other um, uh, competing information out there. And so we have you know, this cultural, this historical legacy of um, Dr. Sims in gynecology being the father of gynecology and um, developing many of his um, surgeries on women of color without anesthesia. Um, and the, the Skiggy study was, um, oh, in the 40s. So it's not been that long ago, Danielle. Um, uh, so um, uh, in, the in the 20th century, excuse me. I don't want to say the 40s to the 60s. Um, and so it's Jim Crow era. Um, and so, uh, and then, um, so there's that historical, I don't trust. And then there's the fear of, there was a lot of people saying, we're going to give it to Blacks first. And that was well intended, but what it felt like was, we're going to test it on the Blacks first. Um, and so, um, then, and so what we're trying to do myself, I'll say myself, but other black physicians when we're talking is to be very public about our experience. Yes, I got the vaccine, I'm super excited. These were my side effects. Be very transparent, not to what, not to wash over that it was the greatest vaccine ever. No, it wasn't the most super friendly vaccine ever. Um, did I feel crazy, bad, not the greatest for 36 hours? Yes. Am I super excited that I have the vaccine, um, but really trying to give that truth um, in it, and then asking serious questions like, well, you've seen many of your community die from COVID, um, so that's a real threat. And then we have these theoretical threats of the vaccine, risk benefit, which are you most comfortable with? And giving people that information and not pushing it upon them, but allowing them to, um, to sort through that and then hopefully they will come along. But absolutely, um, we are struggling um, to get that trust relationship rebuilt and to get to get people to be vaccinated. Thank you. Mary asks, can the use of mobile health clinics help in the distribution of the vaccine, like having clinics at churches or workplaces? I think um, I think mobile vaccines are that grass or mobile clinics are that grassroots. Um, and then when you're at your church, you have trusted church leaders there who are doing it with you, who are saying, I think it's safe. So I, I do think that um, is the that is the path forward um, is um, that community connection. Um, and it's people in the community. I had spoken with Pastor Portia and Ira Combs, who are very active in the North American church community. Um, but it's those sort of trusted community leaders, Ernie Chambers, um, that uh, Brenda Council, that you see and you say, okay, well, I don't, they, they, they're, they're cynical. They question everything. If they're doing it, then I think I'm okay. Um, yes. Um, getting back to our basics of what we are as Americans on the, on the ground. Mm -hmm. Priscilla asks, besides medical and grocery deserts, are there also drugstore deserts that you've observed in Omaha? Hey, you know, I would love to look at that, Priscilla, if there were drugstore deserts. There are like dialysis deserts, um, physical therapy. Like when I drive out west, there's physical therapy offices everywhere, um, but they're not necessarily physical therapy offices in North. Home health care, um, it's harder to get nurses to go to home, um, into homes um, in uh, North and South Omaha. Um, so yeah, it's just different um, and trying to um, shake that up a bit um, would be really helpful and expand that. So I'll have to look at that. Um, and again, I'll have to employ someone like Kelly who's very good technically and will do a nice dot plot of all of those things. Um, but I would suspect, yes. I know the Walgreens on 45th and Ames right by Fontenelle Park just closed last year. Um, and that was a very common Walgreens um, that was used. Thank you. John asks, are there differences between racial groups among men and women with respect to infection propensity? No, and so I think this again comes to um, that this idea um, uh, that of a biological reason for infection um, versus a situational um, reason for infection. Um, so um, no. Thanks. <laughs> Mary asks, is there a hope for a vaccine for children? 
in 2021. I love to be able to yeah, I love to be able to answer that. Children's just announced on Monday that they will have a vaccine trial um, for um, Pfizer um, for children here. Um, so um, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Jose Romero and Dr. Archie Chatterjee, who were here and are now in different locations, have been actively working with the CDC um, and uh, um, working to make sure that we have a vaccine accessible. And I agree. I think um, our initial information at the end of March last year that came out from China um, had uh, like 3,000 um, cases of uh, children that had COVID-19. And so there was this original thought, I'm sure many of you remember that, that kids aren't getting COVID. Kids aren't going to get it. It's just going to be for adults. Um, and we now know that's not true. Um, and we now know that um, it is impacting children uh, significantly. Um, but I think our initial information um, from um, China was not to worry. And I think maybe from Italy, it was that their population age is different. And so when we looked at um, their experience, it just spoke to a different demographic. Um, but a year later, we recognized that we really need to get this vaccine to kids. Um, and uh, uh, while we, I think, have only had two deaths in the state of Nebraska, oh, six, excuse me, six deaths in the state of Nebraska, in children, we've had a lot of hospitalizations. And so um, that's a real deal. And then the fact that they are a vector um, for disease um, for their families um, and uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So we have a couple folks chiming in um, with their own hypotheses. Yeah, on, I love that. <laughs> yeah, on perhaps why um, Asians. Asians do not uh, seem to be getting COVID at the same rate as others. So we have someone talking about wearing masks and then also yes. about how in many Southeast Asian countries, citizens are more likely to follow government and scientific orders because of social construct. It's mm -hmm. more about the we than the I. So do you have any comments on that? I love that. Um, and I would agree. I remember um, January, 2020, flying home from a girl's trip. And I said to my husband, all the Asians in the airport were wearing masks. What do you think that's about? Now, in hindsight, you know, they knew about COVID-19 in December and January. I had an email from January 4th that said, um, rare pneumonia um, emerging out of Wuhan, China. Um, but I agree with that um, statement that um, mask wearing isn't new to them. Um, and, um, and so the social comfort of mask wearing, um, but also um, the we versus I and following um, the, the orders, that's not in our American spirit. Um, we, um, uh, and maybe that's what makes us wonderful, but it, it, it's, it's a challenge for us to overcome. So I don't wanna put it as a negative. I just think that we look at the I um, and especially since the 1970s, we really look at that individual um, has, a, has a right. Um, and I joke with my mom that it's her generation that is struggling the most with um, the rules um, because they were hippies and they had independence and they had um, self-determination. Um, and um, uh, it's very hard to, um, to take on that your behavior or your actions have impact. Um, but I do think that that's a very reasonable thing that um, who's really good at wearing masks um, is going to do better with this. I can tell that we're taking our masks off. I worked in the ER overnight last night. And usually for the um, winter, we have the majority of our patients that we admit have bronchiolitis, RSV, some kind of cold symptoms. We've had zero influenza. And yesterday was the first bronchiolitis case that I personally had treated, but our group had maybe had three. And normally if we have 30 kids, 15 of them a day, are on our service have bronchiolitis, but I can tell that we're taking our masks off because we're starting to see a little bit of that bronchiolitis come back in. Um, but mask wearing, yeah, I like that. I'm gonna have to write that down. <laughs> Thank you. And then, okay, so David commented on a hope for developing a program where new doctors could work off some of their debt 
by working a, a certain number of years in an area um, where it's underserved. And I believe there is a, a national program like that. Could you describe more about? Yeah. So there are national programs for debt repayment um, where you do a certain number of years in a, what they would call an underserved area. So Charles Drew has, or Charles Drew Clinic would count for that. Um, and people have to do three to five years and then they have debt paid off. Um, and we probably need to publicize those more. Um, uh, um, because um, student loan debt does drive people away from primary care. Um, one of the reasons I think Columbia um, Medical School is getting rid of um, uh, their sort of um, tuition, trying to create a more natural selection of what you would go into versus I have $200,000 in um, student loan debt, so I have to be an anesthesiologist. There was um, a, a senator, uh, um, and I'm not going to remember specifically, um, who um, did a, um, inflation adjusted debt comparative, because I think for many of, um, so even for me, compared to my new partners, um, compared to my mentors, um, the debt is very different. So if medical school cost $1,500 um, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, um, what was that debt compared to what the debt is today? And it was, um, it's just astronomical. And so I think that's why it's very hard for our parents' generation to understand what is the impact of that student loan debt on um, monthly um, costs. So, you know, when you looked at repaying your student loans, it used to be like about 10% or less of your monthly income. And my partners are paying 50% of their monthly income towards student loan debts. So very hard. Yeah. Very hard. That's why the millennials are so bitter. They have a <laughs> lot of student loan debt. You've picked up on that? No, I'm just <laughs> on the bitterness? <laughs> yes, I love that it's from Beth Ann. Um, that was in med school in 19, yes, $5,000 for tuition. I love that. So I think looking at what that, and people would say, oh, the inflation, that would make that, and it might make that $15,000, but it won't make it $200,000. And so looking at the real significant difference between um, what, um, what this student loan debt does to um, people um, and their choices and why they aren't working in communities of color and why they are doing plastic surgery and anesthesia um, and interventional radiologist. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at Barry's question. He says that most activists and Black Lives Matter activities seem to be wearing masks. Mm -hmm. Um, and talking about the success in that and demonstrating with masks. And then could you possibly compare the infection rates of these rallies with some other political rallies, which were maskless? Well, you know, um, these are, um, th this is a tiptoe question where you try to tiptoe around um, things. I did protest um, and I was really impressed. Um, it was very random. Um, uh, I went to, I think God is great and God puts me in situations again, like I said in the beginning, um, Beth Ann introduced me like I had really thought out this um, um, life that I'm living, but I went to get Camp, uh, Panda Express and I saw some people standing on 72nd and Dodge. And I was like, I wonder what that is. And then I saw that they were protesting for George Floyd's murder. So I called my husband and I said, I think I'm going to protest. And he said, get your butt home. And I said, it feels important. So I called my best friend. And my best friend is this lovely um, Jewish white woman. And she was like, I'm going to have my husband drop me off right now. And so we're out there. And they have a medic. They have boxes of water. They have masks. Um, they have a lawyer there who's telling people, get off the median, stay on the side of the street. There's old people, there's college professors, there's kids, there's dogs. It was like exciting and a great energy and really positive. Now there were a couple people that their energy felt different. I don't know, I don't wanna say that they were there to incite um, sort of a different um, purpose, but the majority of the people that were there, you're right, they were giving out masks, um, which was good when they pepper sprayed us. Um, and I agree. Um, so then my silly butt was just curious about the Trump rally in, um, the right before the um, election. So I had to drive down there, which again, my husband says, bring your butt home. And I was like, I just want to see it. I'm just going to drive by and no one's wearing masks. And so I do think what's really sad to me is um, 
this should have never had to have been about whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or whether you're conservative or liberal. It really should have been about how do we keep each other safe? And it shouldn't really have get, been given that background noise um, um, because I, I would like to believe that we all want our families to be healthy um, regardless of our um, beliefs. Um, and it was sad that people were making bad choices um, for their families and themselves. Yes, I was pepper sprayed. It's real silly. That's when I said, maybe it's time to go home. And my best friend said, I don't want to get arrested tonight. So we got in the car. That sounds terrible. <laughs> I assume she drove you home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had my car at Target because I um, I parked there because I was the one getting the Panda Express. So I drove her home. Mm. So it's all good. It's all good. The endeavors, the crazy endeavors of us. There's a couple comments about uh, something that I'm sure makes complete sense to you. <laughs> okay, I can read uh, it. Yeah, why don't you read through Rick's comment? Yes. So the cytokine storm is really fascinating. So one of my partners um, is um, collecting um, um, or not salvage blood. So he does a study where for patients admitted to the hospital with either COVID or COVID complication, he consents the family that if there's any leftover blood, that blood, so we wouldn't draw blood on the patient, but if there was leftover blood, that blood gets sent to the lab. And so they've been analyzing um, the blood on patients with severe, so uh, in the ICU, COVID or COVID complications and looking at their um, uh, different proteins. And the cytokine storm is specifically um, one of the interesting areas of why there are, why certain people have such significant disease and why some of the steroids or um, uh, rheumatology medications have worked so well in treating uh, serious COVID. And so um, I'll have to watch the segment. Um, but yes, if we could control the cytokine storm, because it seems to be that what we're seeing as that COVID complication is the pro-inflammation. So the COVID comes in, starts, hits a domino, and then the cytokine storm goes off um, and the COVID is gone, but the cytokine storm is raging and we have all this inflammation. And then we end up with what we call COVID lung, which just looks like terrible Swiss cheese or you have blood clots or strokes. Um, and so that inflammatory response. Um, so I'll be really interested. Now, Rick, you say that the drug is $1 a day, but you know, if it works, that's not how much we'll charge for it in America. So, um, uh, but I love that. Oh, Henrietta Lacks. Oh, the stor terrible story of Henrietta Lacks and her cervical cancer cells um, that have changed uh, cancer research forever um, and that her family is impoverished and that she was never um, asked um, if that was, I never gave her permission. That is one of the many tragedies of a uh, lot and the reasons for loss of trust um, in uh, uh, the black community. Um, yes. I would agree, David. Do Any we cover all the questions? questions? Yeah, pop in the chat. Um, and I, um, I try to not stir up too, too much controversy, but I do think it's important to look at what our, um, um, our history has sort of created for us and then what we need to do to make a change if we don't know that the reason why everyone lives in North Omaha was because that's where they could get access to housing um, or um, that there is um, a food desert or a medical desert and that we need to really look at that. So um, I hope that wasn't uh, too much. I can ask a question. Um, Given that the cytokine storm is really perpetrated, it perpetrates a huge amount of inflammation, but the early inflammation in an early COVID infection may be actually helping. You didn't say anything when you were talking about those folks at the, the racetrack and so forth, all suddenly being given the pill. I was thinking, gee, wouldn't timing of something that inhibits inflammation be very important? So I agree with you. That's so, and um, 
I remember hearing someone say in maybe April, um, uh, if you're going to get sick, don't get sick until like maybe the fall because we're going to get better at taking care of it. And so I agree, Richard, that we um, the timing of when we give steroids, the timing of um, remdesivir, um, and uh, it does play a part, I think. Um, we, we're still working it out, but if you look at the survival in Nebraska, we're doing a better job of taking care of people because we're giving um, uh, those steroids at the right time, not too early, not too late. So it's sort of that question of people getting steroids as an outpatient, that may not actually help because we want that um, white cell to come in. But once you're in the hospital and on oxygen, that's when we would give the steroids um, and talking to my adult colleagues. For us, as, as for me as a pediatrician, um, our main struggle is not so much acute COVID. Um, we, we're doing okay with the acute COVID. It's something called the multi-inflammatory um, systemic disease, MISC. Um, that is the Kawasaki's like. So it's huge inflammation. Um, the cardiac cells seem to have a propensity towards it, um, towards the um, uh, reaction. And so we have cardiac dysfunction, um, coronary artery disease, um, and a little bit of an encephalopathy or confusional state and blood clots. Um, and so uh, we're doing something called IVIG, which I think of as kind of like a modern leech. Um, we're not exactly sure how it works, but we give IVIG, which is made from uh, plasma. And we think it binds to bad proteins and then kind of like a vacuum cleaner binds to the bad proteins and then you pee them out and then super high dose steroids. Um, and then some of the kids are progressing to anakinra which is a TNF alpha uh, blockade. So it goes back to that cytokine storm. Um, but I do think, you know, 12 months later, we're a little bit smarter. We meet about every two weeks to look and talk about um, whether our treatment is still um, on with what the national standard is and what other people have decided um, uh, or what other groups have come up with. Um, and so I think we're getting smarter all the time about the timing of medication, um, which medications, who gets which medications. Um, but uh, so much to learn, so much to learn yet. So don't take the steroids right away. Yeah. <laughs> There's another question from Douglas. It is risky to generalize about an entire community, but are there ways that people get current information about medical information uh, that lead to vaccine resistance? If so, what are the influencers that lead to resistance? Yeah, and so I love that, Doug. It is it is risky. And so, you know, whenever I give these talks, I'm always like, well, you know, I mean, I, we're may, I try to stick with facts, like what are actual policies or actual facts and not, well, I think most Blacks think that because I'm not a typical Black. I was raised by a white woman. I have had a lot of... Um, uh, benefit of higher education, um, and I don't know if that's typical or not typical. I'm just, I'm just myself, so I think it's hard to generalize. Um, and then um, I, I'm not on those platforms, and so I think um, it's probably important for people um, who really want to make a difference to get on those platforms and to see um, who those influencers are. When I talk to the by, um, uh, mom of my foster girls, she gets a lot of information from Facebook about blood types and uh, COVID, about monkey DNA and the vaccine. Um, uh, so I, I, I speak a little bit about WhatsApp because I'd read a little bit about um, that being a source of information for um, people in the US to send information to their family in Mexico about, the, about COVID-19. Um, but you're right that we probably need to get on those platforms. Um, and um, and try to counter some of that um, misinformation. Um, I'm just, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know anything about the SSRIs and antidepressants. So Craig, I'd love if you would tell us about that. Yeah, and let here, let me. <laughs> yeah, let's unmute him so that Yeah, can... let me permit folks to unmute themselves. So Craig Hahn, if you would want to jump in and explain your question a little bit more. 
Actually, I think um, my question is a question towards myself. As a pharmacist, I'm really interested to understand how an SSRI antidepressant can uh, can work in a uh, COVID storm. So, I know, and now you're, you're going to have to make me, I'm going to go read about this. Yeah, me also. I'll, I'll catch you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, we're, we're much smarter a year later, and hopefully even two years from now, we'll have a better idea of how to um, interrupt the, the storm. Um, from uh, Beth Ann Brooks about open heart surgery. So we haven't had to do any open heart surgery. Um, it's all um, sort of function support. So um, pressors that help keep the blood pressure up. Um, the um, IVIG and high dose steroids helps with the myocarditis and the inflammation. And then we're on blood thinners to prevent um, blood clots. And um, they've all done extraordinarily well. Um, and um, uh, so we haven't had any deaths locally from MISC, but we've had some very sick kids. Um, initially, all of our kids were Hispanic, but I think that spoke to who was having um, COVID um, from our meatpacking plants and our essential workers. Um, and that demographic has kind of shifted and now it's more generalized to what our um, Omaha population is. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to read David's questions. Um, are children in schools fairly safe without using their masks? So I, um, I'm a big mask proponent. I have an almost eight-year-old and a nine-year-old and a 17-year-old. And my kids wear masks way better than um, adults. Um, so in the summer last year, they still wanted to go to summer camp and they wore their masks and they didn't fuss about it and they wear their masks to school and they don't fuss about it and they do some activities because I'm going crazy with them in the house. So I, um, we, uh, we do. So um, I, um, I would say that while the children might be safe, there are people in the schools that are adults that have to educate them. And our original thought that children didn't have the virus is untrue or that they aren't sharing it is untrue. So. Um, kids that have a big enough cough, so five, when you can kind of give a loogie. I don't know, David, how old you were when you could do a loogie, but probably later for me. But um, if you can cough big enough to um, spread um, uh, a spitball, then you need to wear a mask. Um, and so I'm not um, super worried about the... Now, I do think it's fascinating to watch children developmentally as a pediatrician um, and the um, babies that are um, have been born in this age of masks. Um, uh, so we will all have trauma from this pandemic. So none of us will come away unchanged from this pandemic, but I want us all to survive. Um, so uh, when we say like, yes, it's affecting kids and their development and under how they understand, sure, yes it is, but we still need the masks. Um, so, uh, so I would say, nope, those 10 year olds, there's a teacher in that room. There's a, there's a cafeteria lady in that um, school um, and the janitor and the police or the security officer that would appreciate them wearing their masks. I wanted to point out the distinction of children under the age of 10. They seem to, in private schools that are functioning right now, they, they let them go without masks and the older children have to wear masks. Yeah, and I don't know how they pick 10. Um, the CDC would say five, the American Academy of Pediatrics would say five. Um, so uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that I love 10 because I think my 10 year old or my nine year old um, should have a mask on. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think, um, yeah, I, it, you know, everybody's trying to do their best to figure out how to walk that line um, between um, get kids in school and um, there are lots of um, health risks this year. We have mental health risks. Um, so, you know, it's not a zero sum or negative um, uh, game here. Um, this is Beth Ann. My goddaughter is a second grade teacher in the Millard schools. And I got a call from her. She had had um, a known case of a father of a student be infected, positive test for COVID. Um, the girl followed the student, the second grader followed whatever the quarantine isolation guidelines were. 
returned to my goddaughter's classroom. And the only um, restriction that the school district put on the little girl was she had to eat lunch separately. And then my goddaughter, uh, in retrospect, worried about um, she did not have the little girl isolate or have her snack by herself. One and a half days after returning to school, the little second grader developed symptoms. Mm -hmm. One and a half days after that, my goddaughter developed COVID. So it's a really efficient virus. And um, that's and what I that say. It's the trans. They're transmitters. Uh, they are. But in this case, the little girl did test positive. So it went from adult to second grader to adult. Yeah, um, and I had worked with my son's school and some of our private schools aren't sharing their data on um, testing or aren't testing. And some of the schools have adjusted and even our own um, health department has adjusted the quarantine different from the CDC, shortened it. Um, and so that makes it hard um, when we say, well, we're only going to quarantine for seven days when it still says 10 days um, because we're so, you know, trying to keep things normal. Um, and um, I think what we have found with this virus is um, we, if we have zero flu, um, the, the masks work amazing for flu, um, but we're still having coronavirus. So we know it's still a relatively efficient virus, even under pretty good masking guidelines, because I think the schools are doing a great job and really trying to keep these kids there wiping down and spraying and, you know, sitting one direction. Um, and, and yet there's still, there's not a huge spread in school. So I think that there's great evidence for kids to be in school, um, but it's not zero. Um, and so that, that would be the reason that even little seven-year-olds can cough enough to spread this, um, this virus, so. Um, I know that's so sad. And she, I hope she did okay, Beth Ann. She did. And um, she was very uh, lucky that her in laws went to her in Florida so she could uh, isolate quarantine for 14 days at their home because yeah. her husband is a type 1 diabetic. Yeah. And so that is, those are some of the benefits that we have when we think about, like, I have my emergency plan, which is if somebody gets COVID. I will take, you know, I'm going to go to somebody's condo that's empty. Um, um, so we have some different or the basements um, and that we're able to isolate uh, very different than um, uh, uh, other people with less resources. Um, so our meatpacking plants were hit very hard. I think there's going to be some fallout about unethical practices um, from that. Um, we really also struggled again with getting accurate information. But the other thing, even prior to COVID, when I would have patients, parents who were, had their child in the hospital, um, the meatpacking plants go on points um, for employment. And there are no sort of passes for points if you miss regardless of a doctor's notes or illness. So um, if you want the job, you have to show up for the shift. So um, you know, uh, I'm very used to working at a job that has sick leave um, and that does not have a penalty for um, being sick. Um, but the practices in many of these plants is you miss your, so many days you're out. So there was clearly an, a disincentive from staying home sick. And so then we have sick workers in close contact without proper um, PPE. Um, and so it's just a recipe for disaster um, uh, in those plants. So in some ways we still need, um, you know, how we had labor unions, we still need some advocacy groups to help um, with these uh, essential workers um, uh, advocating for them for sick leave and protected time. Um, otherwise we're gonna have this continue on and on. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, Kelly, thank you for saying that. I think there's going to be some fallout um, as we look at um, how things um, played out in our meatpacking plants um, and our poultry plants, um, both, you know, in Nebraska and Iowa, um, and as these advocacy groups uh, come in and try to help. Poor access to health care. Has Nebraska society responded in ways that have made them less at risk or do all the initial medical inequities remain in change? Um, uh, so I, I think these are, I think we're trying to respond. I think we're early on in the acceptance 
phase. I think, you know, um, having news stories that say systemic racism is real and segregation is real are big steps for us to say, we have a problem and we need to do something about it. Um, I really feel, I say this term Nebraska nice, but I really feel that um, for much of my life, we just wanted to believe that it was okay and we could move on and it will get better. And we didn't really have to talk about those hard conversations. Um, and so now we're talking about those hard conversations and we're saying, um, maybe we have to do something to lift these people up instead of blaming them for being down. So I, I want to be hopeful um, in that we're going to um, uh, work to work harder to change. But have we done a lot to impact it? No, we're still pretty. Uh, we still have a lot of work to go. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have um, con uh, questions or comments they want to direct to Dr. Stuhlman? If I could add one thing. I, I heard a, a lecture one time by a, a black lady who was talking about her mother who lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She'd had two of her, her first two children were born at home and she decided to have her third child in the hospital. So she goes to the hospital in labor and they accept her, but they put her in the basement, you know, with the boxes and, and just junk down there. And she realized that she was better off at home than, than in the basement of this hospital. So she got dressed and went home. But I just thought that was terribly humiliating and, and no respect and boo. Yeah, it's, isn't it hard to imagine, Richard, that um, we would have interacted with each other that way um, not, you know, 60 years ago, um, mm -hmm. that, that a doctor, a well-intended doctor would have felt that that was a reasonable place to put a woman to have a baby. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but again, so much of this is been subtly taught to us, um, through images, um, Shakespeare and his images of Othello as the black beast have taught us that black men are big and scary. Um, and um, uh, images in um, Star Wars have taught us that um, my family's Caribbean. And so I was very offended by the Jar Jar Binks character in Star Wars that um, a Caribbean um, man is, you know, clumsy and, sen and silly and um, senseless. Um, so I think we have all of these subtle images that are informing us how we're to believe people are based on their race. And we still want to believe that there's some biology that makes us so different. Um, uh, and yet it is strictly melanin. Um, and, um, and so I think we have a lot of growth as, a, um, as humanity to recognize each other as human. Um, and this is only speaking about race and ethnicity, not on sexuality. I think um, we're really at a, at a cusp um, of uh, trying to move from tolerance. I like to think that well, the way I was taught was that don't stare um, and just don't make a big fuss and that you'll tolerate that difference. And what I really hope that we move to is acceptance, that it's not that we're staring we're asking because we're interested and we're concerned and that we see the difference. My mother, well-intended as a wonderfully warm-hearted white woman would tell me, I don't see color. And that was sort of how she was raised to be tolerant. And I would like to move us to where we see color and we accept it and we embrace the differences um, and the diversity. Um, so things to do. Karen, I think those are apt comments for uh, closing because it's uh, very obvious that you can discuss hard subjects uh, such as racial disparities and uh, medical care and yet maintain optimism and hope with things we can do. And as we're not just identifying problems, but um, you... Uh, gave us hope in terms of, of solutions. And I, I think that's fabulous. And this has really been a great uh, capstone lecture uh, to the pandemic series this year. And we are ever in your debt. I am grateful to, thankful to be invited and to be able to have these conversations um, and um, hopeful for, um, for us to keep having these conversations. So thank you.
Thank you, Sharon. Thanks very much. Thank you.